Well, good evening, Brian, and welcome to the Lodge Hope of Karachi number 337 and our lockdown lecture series, meeting number 51. It's a miserable night outside, Brian, and I'm glad that you've decided to come and spend the next hour in the company of the members of the Lodge Hope of Karachi and all our visitors from not just uh, Fife and Kinross, but across Scotland and further afield across the whole globe. It's a pleasure to see you here this evening, Brian. As ever, can I remind you of the Grand Lodge of Scotland guidance on Zoom meetings. Please keep your video on as much as you can. Uh, we do accept bandwidth challenges, Brian. Please have a recognisable name within the square as well. It's very much appreciated. And particularly it helps our uh, immediate past master and secretary to take a tile for our history books, Brian. Talking about a tile, please do sign the virtual tile on our Facebook pages. Thank you so much. Brian, this evening I'm delighted to bring uh, quite a well Kent face uh, to the Lodge Hope of Karachi lockdown lecture series. Uh, he's a, a past master of Lodge Montefiore through in Glasgow and uh, he is resident through uh, overseas in Israel. And this evening, Brother Ori Lovett is going to tell us the history of the Grand Lodge of Israel and its connections uh, to the Grand Lodge of Scotland. At this point, Ori, can I hand the floor over to you? You are able to share your screen and we very much look forward to the next 45 minutes or so. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um. Well, thank you very much. Um, should I share the screen? Yes, you should be able to, Ori. Yeah. How's that? Is that any better? No. Nope. Not yet. That's not worked. Um, well, it does say share screen, but it's not. That. No. Nope. I can see your Zoom screen. No. I couldn't see your presentation. No, I don't have a presentation. I'm just talking. Oh, you're just going to talk. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, can you um, handle that one from there? Yes, that's fine. Okay. You're good right. to go. Um, okay. Th uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, good evening, Brad, and thank you very much, Gordon, for inviting me here this evening. Um, I'm not actually, this is not really a potted history of the Grand Lodge of Israel, far from it. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the involvement of the Grand Lodge of Scotland in establishing the Grand Lodge of Israel. It's not a full history by any means. Um, but I will kick off by um, giving a very brief history of Freemasonry in the Holy Land. Um, the first uh, recorded meeting of Freemasons uh, in the Holy Land was in 1868 when uh, Brother Dr. Robert Morris, uh, past Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Kentucky, directed a secret monitor meeting in the cave of Zedekiah, which is under the old city of Jerusalem. Now, as an aside here, uh, brethren, um, Zedekiah's cave, um, which is a, a huge cave uh, right under the old city of Jerusalem was the site where, where the, uh, much of the, the stones from, um, for King Solomon's temple, for the first temple, were actually mined. Uh, this is King Solomon's quarry. And um, it's, uh, you can, it, there's a public entrance. You can go and have a look at it. Uh, it's quite awesome. Um, for a few shekels, the entrance is just about, 100 uh, meters north of the Damascus, northeast of the Damascus Gate. Um, occasionally it's used for uh, Masonic meetings. Uh, the last uh, meeting I was at was just before the, this Corona thing started, um, just over a year ago. It was a, a mark degree. Um, so you can imagine holding a mark degree in King Solomon quarries it is a fantastic sight if you ever get a chance to. To, to get invited to one of these uh, meetings, I suggest you take it up. Anyway, um, one of the of those uh, people that were attending this meeting was Charles Warren, who was on a, an archaeological dig at the time, and he went on uh, under Sir Charles Warren to be the, a founder and the first master of Katakoranati. Um, 
And after some trials and tribulations, Dr. Morris erected the first regular lodge in the Holy Land in 1873 under a charter from the Grand Lodge of Ontario. Now, this was the Royal Solomon Mother Lodge 293, meeting at uh, court, uh, Jerusalem and other places. Um, most of the, the brethren were Messianic Christians, and the lodge actually founded eventually and was erased from the role in 1907. The next Masonic Lodge to be formed in what is now Israel was set up in Jaffa in 1890. And this was Le Porte du Temple de Hoa Salman, um, the, the gate of King Solomon's temple. And the members of this lodge were drawn from all religions. Um, and they had a healthy number of affiliates from uh, a French engineers who were working on the, the um, Jaffa to Jerusalem uh, railway at that time. Um, and they had received a charter from the Grand Lodge of Egypt under the Misraim uh, right. Now, realizing that this was not a regular jurisdiction, for some reason, they transferred the jurisdiction to the Grand Lodge of uh, the Orient, which of course is, is also irregular. However, eventually they did get it right. And today under the, the name of Barkai or uh, Don, it is the oldest extant lodge in Israel, although it now works in Hebrew rather than the original French. A number of other lodges were founded before the First World War, uh, and they were affiliated to a number of jurisdictions. Um, after the First World War, the province of Palestine, which was under uh, British mandate, became home to a number of lodges. And by 1948, um, at the end of the mandate, there were eight Scottish lodges, four English lodges, and possibly an Irish lodge. And I say possibly an Irish lodge because although a number of writers have referred to an Irish lodge, I um, don't think there actually was one. I haven't found any hard evidence of it. I think just one of these myths that has been perpetuated. Um, in 1933, the National Grand Lodge of Palestine was set up under the auspices of the Grand Lodge of Egypt. Now, it was chartered by Fahd Ben Hussein, uh, a company who came to Israel or to Palestine uh, uh, with, uh, with a large deputation from Egypt. Um, and it was inaugurated in a court in the presence of brethren consisting of Jews, Muslims, and Christians. Um, and however, although most of the, the French uh, lodges, the Egyptian lodges, and in fact, most of the other lodges in the Holy Land affiliated to this new Grand Lodge, uh, there was a problem with the Scottish and the English lodges because the Grand Lodge of Egypt itself was not regular or recognized by any of the, the three home Grand Lodges. Um, so there was there two groups. There was no formal contact between the Scottish and English lodges and these lodges that came under the umbrella of the National Grand Lodge of Palestine. Although I do understand that relations between the brethren were, were, were quite cordial, but uh, formally there was no interaction. Now, another interesting phenomenon that occurred uh, in this period in the early 30s was the establishment of uh, either four or five German lodges under the jurisdiction of the symbolic Grand Lodge of Germany. Now, um, the German master at that time, Grand Master Leo Muffelmann, uh, with, I think, incredible foresight, predicted the rise of Hitler and with the prescription of Freemasonry in Germany and the consequence of what would follow. And he traveled to the Holy Land and with the help of other brethren fleeing the Nazis, set up uh, lodges, uh, German lodges in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv and Haifa. And he kept the flame of German Freemasonry alive during the war. Uh, regretfully and unfortunately, he returned to Germany and he was murdered in a concentration camp along with many other thousands of, of Freemasons in Germany. Now, this new Grand Lodge, as I've said, which was set up in 1933, was not recognized by any regular lodge apart from the Grand Lodge, or any regular Grand Lodge, apart from the, the Grand Lodge of New York for a particular reason. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly why. However, after the Second World War, there was an influx of Jewish refugees into the Holy Land, many of whom were Freemasons. So the number of Freemasons in the region began to, to swell. And in 1948, the State of Israel was established and some lodges at this time simply vanished. Um, as the 
soldiers, uh, the military, and the civilian administration returned back to the United Kingdom. One of the four English lodges, King Solomon's uh, Temple, uh, 4611, he, it relocated back to London, and I believe it still meets there in Great Queen Street. The other three English lodges simply handed back their charters. Of the eight Scottish lodges, five remained in Israel under the Scottish jurisdiction. Um, one Lodge Carmel simply disappeared. Um, Lodge Golden Throne uh, continued to meet in East Jerusalem, which was occupied by Jordan at that time. And another lodge, uh, the Jordan Lodge from Jaffa, it relocated to Amman, and it is still in existence uh, uh, today, a meeting today under Scottish jurisdiction. There were, of course, other Scottish lodges in the region. Um, and today there's, um, as, as you know, there's a Scottish district in Lebanon. Um, there's Scottish lodges in Jordan, but unfortunately, as far as I'm aware, there are no lodges now uh, meeting in Syria or in most of the other Arab countries. Um, the Freemasonry and Arab dictatorships seem to be uh, mutually exclusive uh, organizations. Um, for example, in Egypt, before Nasser came to power, there were over 60 lodges in, in Egypt. Uh, now there are none, as far as I am aware. Um, on October the 20th, 1953, the Grand Lodge of Israel was established by the late Earl of Elgin, past Grand Master, under the Scottish Constitution. Now, how did this come about? Well, there are a number of first, of excellent first-hand accounts uh, about the, the consecration meeting that took place in Jerusalem with all the pomp and ceremony when the Grand Lodge was established. But there's very little other than vague references that tell the story of how this came about. Um, some writers have referred to discussions or negotiations, but there's been very little detail. And I was very fortunate um, to have access to the, the private papers of the late Simon Miller, who was very much involved here. Now, uh, Simon Miller was um, a past master of my Mother Lodge Montefiore 753 in Glasgow, but he was also the catalyst for the Grand Lodge of Israel being established. Now, he was a, he was a very active Freemason, uh, an officer in a provincial in Glasgow, and he had close connections with Grand Lodge in Edinburgh. Um, and I actually remember him uh, in the Lodge over, I'm showing my age, but almost 50 years ago. Um, he was tall, debonair, well educated, and very articulate. And he, um, he was a bachelor. Uh, a well-known philanthropist and his business dealings in ceramics took him to many places in the world and he was a frequent visitor to Israel where he had many Masonic friends in Jerusalem and in, um, in Tel Aviv and he was actually a member of Lord Sharon in, in, in Tel Aviv, one of the Scottish lodges. He also kept meticulous notes and records which he, uh, he, uh, he retained these um, and uh, they came to light just a few years ago when his niece um, made them available. And much of what follows is information that I have extracted from that correspondence. And I, I really want to say, because some of the, the things I may be mentioning are a bit unmasonic, I am quoting from these notes. It's not my own makeup. Um, the State of Israel was established in 1948. By 1950, it was thought expedient to set up a Grand Lodge which was regular and recognized by the principal Grand Lodges. And as, the, the, as I've mentioned, the National Grand Lodge of Palestine uh, was irregular. So by 1950, there were five Scottish Lodges and about 35 to 40 other Lodges falling under uh, the umbrella of the Grand Lodge of Palestine. However, there were few brethren in these Scottish Lodges who had Scottish origins. Um, most of the, the members had either local backgrounds or, or English backgrounds. And one of the reasons I think why the Scottish lodges continued to function uh, and, and thrive after independence was that they had attracted members from the local communities um, in, in Palestine and then Israel, uh, whereas the, the English lodges uh, being a bit more elitist, 
uh, tended to restrict membership to those with British passports or uh, in the case of one lodged army officers or those with equivalent rank. So accordingly, because of this English connection, uh, the first port of call was to petition the United Grand Lodge of England for a charter to set up a Grand Lodge under their auspices. At that time, the, the, uh, after the war, the Foreign Secretary was Ernest Bevan, who was very proud of the fact that he was a raving anti-Semite and anti-Zionist who publicly declared in a quote that all the evils of the world were as a result of a Jewish communist conspiracy. He put pressure on the United Grand Lodge of England to reject these approaches and to the eternal shame, I think, of the United Grand Lodge of England, they acceded to this political pressure and refused the petition. And this was despite remonstrations from some very prominent uh, Freemasons, both Jewish and otherwise, in London. And in fact, the United Grand Lodge of England did not recognise the Grand Lodge of Israel until 1957, of course, after there had been a change of government. And this was a long time after most of the other Grand Lodges in the world had recognised the Grand Lodge of Israel. To their eternal credit, the Grand Lodge of ancient and accepted Freemasons of Scotland had no such reservations. I don't know, but this is because of the, they were truer to Masonic principles or um, they wished to uh, further the prosperity of Scottish lodges in, in the district, or just as a result of good relations both of, over many years, the, the, the Grand Lodge of Scotland refused to give way to political pressure and were very keen to sponsor a Grand Lodge in Israel. And the story here seems to have started around about 1950. Uh, and there seemed to be three main brethren who pushed very hard uh, for the Scottish involvement. And they were, of course, um, Simon Miller, as I've mentioned. There was a Max Silverstone, who was an inspector with the, uh, the Anglo-Palestine Bank, and Max Seligman, who was um, an advocate in uh, both in Israel and in London. And around the middle of April 1950, there seemed to emerge a, a plan to petition the Grand Lodge of Scotland, and a resolution to this effect was approved by, uh, the, by the five Scottish lodges and countersigned by 26 past masters. So there was, at that time, there was a preliminary meeting with uh, Brother Beck, who was the secretary of the Foreign and Colonial Committee, who then came back to, uh, after consulting his committee to say that they'd left it to him to further this proposition. And as a result, Max Silverstone travelled to Edinburgh uh, to discuss the proposition with uh, Brother Beck and with Alec Buchan, who was the, the Grand Secretary, and with Simon Miller, who appears to have been the conduit between the parties for these negotiations. Now, the main problem at this stage was that if a new Grand Lodge was to be established, it would need the support of those lodges that came under the, the umbrella of the Grand Lodge of Palestine, which of course was not recognized by the three Grand Lodges, uh, and as I've mentioned, by any other Grand Lodge other than that of New York. So um, the Grand Secretary, Alec Buchan, is, uh, confirmed that he would write to the other two Grand Lodges uh, and also to the Grand Lodge of New York to try to find a, a solution to get acquiescence to form this new Grand Lodge. Um, and of course, things were delayed uh, and time went on because the Grand Secretary uh, required a report from the uh, um, from Brother uh, JLC Colenso Jones, who was the District Grand Master uh, at that time of the Scottish District. So um, there was a lack of progress and the, the brethren in Israel were getting a bit, um, uh, a bit worried. They were complaining about the lack of progress and um, because there were, there were um, the brethren who wanted to start new lodges and couldn't take matters forward. And, 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 and Max Seligman wrote to say that he was getting, he didn't want to be portrayed as being in a bad light by trying to sort of sidestep the Grand Lodge of Palestine at, the, at this time. Um, as it was, obviously things were getting known because the Grand Lodge of Palestine 
made it um, semi-public that they had been in touch with the Grand Lodge of Scotland who were offering, and I quote, lavish promises if they would accept a sponsorship from the Grand Lodge of Scotland. And of course, this was blatantly untrue. And uh, in fact, Alec Buchan wrote to Simon Miller um, um, to this effect. So by 1950, it seems to have been quite known in, well known in Masonic circles in Israel that something was afoot and um, a number of eminent brethren uh, came forward offering their services as principal office bearers in this new Grand Lodge, um, even as Grand Master, if they were so called upon, etc. Um, but by 1951, it became clear that United Grand Lodge of England were not happy. And um, they were being pressed by the Grand Lodge of New York not to agree uh, to this new Grand Lodge being set up under the Scottish uh, Constitution. Now, the protocol was that if one of the three home Grand Lodges want to consecrate a new Grand Lodge, they had to get the consent of the, the, grand, the other two Grand Lodges. So um, there were, uh, the brethren in Israel were really becoming uh, um, impatient and um, by February 1951, Seligman went to Grand Lodge in Edinburgh uh, and he was told that the Grand Lodge of England were, were demurring, uh, accepting a new Grand Lodge. But he was told that the Grand Lodge of Scotland would press the, the, this matter. And uh, I would stress that the information I'm getting here is from the correspondence at the time. So there was a subsequent regular meeting of the three Grand Lodges of which the, the Right Russian Grand Grandmaster and Alec Buchan, among others, were present. And it was recorded uh, in the correspondence I have that the Grand Lodge of Scotland were contemplating a formal breach with the Grand Lodge of England uh, over this matter and that they would proceed with a consecration whether or not the Grand Lodge of England agreed to it or not. And of course, uh, fortunately, the Grand Lodge of England relented and gave their assent, but um, only under a bit of, um, a bit of reluctance. And at this stage, uh, we now had uh, things were further delayed because we had to drop a constitution. Um, eventually, the constitution was drawn up along the same lines as the Scottish constitution um, with uh, certain um, changes to take into account local conditions and what have you. But at this stage, a new hurdle emerged because the Golden Throne Lodge 1344, which I mentioned earlier, had been in, in Jerusalem, and it had thought that it was inactive, uh, it sort of emerged out of the woodwork, and the Lodge Secretary wrote to Grand Lodge of Scotland saying that they were back in business, and as the political situation was unstable, it was not the right time to consecrate a Grand Lodge in Israel. Um, remember, Golden Throne was in Eastern Jerusalem. I think this was just a political um, uh, move. I, I, I can't see why they would ever want to, to say this, but they, uh, they did. Um, however, um, Silverstone successfully argued that Golden Throne 1344 was not even in Israel uh, and we couldn't have any direct contact with them across the border. And of course, and the letter was irrelevant to the petition. Now, I believe Golden Throne recently has been reponed over the last few years. Um, I'm not quite sure where they're meeting, but it's under the Scottish uh, jurisdiction. So now emerged that the Grand Lodge of Ireland were having doubts about agreeing to the consecration. So Seligman, and I'm quoting here, went to Ireland and after a good dinner, uh, wine and cigars with the Grand Secretary, he put this obstacle to rest and the objections, whatever they were, disappeared in true Masonic fashion, of course. Um, so we're now looking for a, a consecration of the new Grand Lodge in spring 1952, but because of the amount of work in, that was going to be required, um, Miller was able to report that although the constitution had been approved, um, there was still a lot of work to be done, so we couldn't really rush into it. Um, but we did now have agreement in principle from the Grand Lodge of Scotland to go ahead. However, 
always not sweetness and light, because by March uh, 1952, uh, Silverstone's reporting to Simon Miller that the local group, and I take it by that he means the, the National Grand Lodge of Palestine, um, were getting upset at this, they were embittered, they said there was no need for two Grand Lodges, and it's obviously a, a power thing. Um, so Ali Buchan suggested that the Grand Lodge of Palestine, uh, the lodges under the Grand National Grand Lodge of Palestine, um, should simply disavow their present allegiance and take a new oath to a new Grand Lodge of Israel. And, um, and at that time, um, Simon Miller suggests that, that Shabbatai Levi, MBE, CBE, a prominent uh, uh, Freemason who was not an office bearer, and he was the mayor of Haifa, should be the first Grand Master. And in fact, he was the first Grand Master. However, by another twist, the Grand Lodge of Palestine at this stage changes its name to the Grand Lodge of Israel. And the Secretary Eliezer Dubinsky writes to Miller saying that the new Grand Lodge of Israel had gained recognition from 11 American Grand Lodges. What well, actually wasn't true. And he hints, and I quote, at unpleasantness. Um, that is going to happen um, if the, the Grand Lodge of Scotland goes ahead without them. But he still wanted an amicable solution. And he even in his letter sent greetings from uh, Grand Master Dr. Shoney. So by the end of July 1953, or in the first week of August 1953, because the meetings, the time's not recorded, there was a meeting either in, in Edinburgh or in London between Shoney the Grand Master of the National Grand Lodge of Palestine, Seligman Miller and Alec Buchan. The meeting was not minuted, but the problems were ironed out. There was um, some sort of fudge was agreed and preparations were made for the establishment of the new Grand Lodge on the 20th of October, 1953. Now, the, the, the Grand Lodge of Scotland was opened in Jerusalem with the Right Honourable the Earl of Elgin and Concarden, past Grand Master in the chair. It was, uh, the meeting was held at uh, four o'clock in the afternoon in the YMCA building. Um, it was quite a lavish affair. It was attended by four or 500 Freemasons. And um, this followed a lunch be, with uh, the main movers and the president of Israel and the King David Hotel across the road. And there was even a post office set up in the foyer of the hotel where you could have your, um, uh, you could send a letter and it would be postmarked um, commemorating the establishment of the Grand Lodge of Israel. I'm sure uh, those among you who are philatelists will probably know a bit about that. However, um, the Grand Lodge of Scotland was opened four o'clock in the afternoon. The senior Grand Warden was Brother uh, Colenso Jones. Junior Grand Warden was Brother Reuben Cohn, who was a founder member and a past master of Lodge Solomon 1209, and he was also an office bearer in Grand Lodge. The Grand Director of Ceremonies was Alec Buchan, and Max Selig Seligman was given the role of Honorary Grand Marshal. The Grand Lodge of Israel was consecrated, and the five Scottish lodges handed back their charters. Um, New charters were now granted to the five petitioning Scottish lodges and to the 25 lodges who previously came under the jurisdiction of the Grand Lodge of Palestine, who also had renounced their charters. The first Grand Master was Shabbatai Levy, and the immediate uh, past master was Dr. Shoney. Unfortunately, Shabbatai Levy retired after a very short time through ill health, and Dr. Shoney became the second Grand Master as part of the fudge, there were two grand secretaries, there were two grand treasurers. Uh, Max Seligman became the grand director of ceremonies and uh, there were um, among the honorary founding members were Simon Miller, um, Sam Campbell from Montefiore of Campbell's whiskey fame, Monty Arnson from Lodge Scotia and a few others from Glasgow as, um, and there were many deputations from uh, grand lodges throughout the, the, the world. Um, all this is, the ceremony itself is well documented, um, so I'm not going to get any details about it, um, but I would like to turn 
to the support given by brethren in the United Kingdom to the new Grand Lodge. Um, Israel in 1953 was a particularly poor country. Um, there weren't many resources. Um, there certainly wasn't enough money about to buy the Galia or, or, or what have you. Um, so they relied on help from abroad. So the United Grand Lodge of England would not allow any of the English lodges to donate towards regalia for the new Grand Lodge. However, many individuals did throughout England and they provided things ranging from furniture, collars and aprons and what have you. In Glasgow, Lodge Montefiore, as a result of a subscription list received, many donations, I have the, the original of that list, people gave anything from half a guinea to 50 guineas, um, and they, uh, the Lodge commissioned the, the Grand Master's jewel and chain of office um, from Nathan Brothers in Birmingham. Um, to, uh, it's a very fancy design it had with the 12 tribes of Israel, and it was in, made in solid gold, and such was the value of this um, chain of office that at that time I had to get home office permission uh, to export the gold and the action and permission from Israel to take the gold in. Um, it would be interesting if the Grand Lodge of Israel could give me an account of actually what happened to this chain. It was used for a number of years and has since disappeared despite my inquiries. Um, the other items the Lodge donated was the volume of the Sacred Law, working tools and other regalia. The Grand Sword was a personal gift from Simon Miller. And again, the whereabouts of this important artifact should be ascertained. I haven't received an exact explanation of where it is at the moment, despite inquiries. Um, and today, well, the reigning master of Montefiore 753 wears with pride on his collar the commemorative medal gifted by the Grand Lords of Israel to Montefiore as a token of thanks. I also have in my possession a copy of a letter from the first Grand Secretary inviting the reigning master of 753 to attend any meetings of the Grand Lodge of Israel in perpetuity. Um, I would just like to move on just for a couple of minutes about what Freemasonry is like in Israel today. Well, we have um, about 1,000 to 1,200 active Freemasons in Israel. Um, we have six lodges working in, in English, which includes Lodge Montefiore 78, which is a, lo a lodge of, uh, pa of um, past masters lodge. Um, we don't carry out ritual, it's a lodge of research. There are um, 33 lodges working in, in Hebrew, four in Arabic, two in Spanish, and one each in French, Russian, Romanian, uh, and Turkish. And there's also Lodge the Holy Land, which meets only occasionally when there's a special occasion or a special deputation from abroad or what have you. Um, the ritual which Grand Lodge of Israel uh, insists, with a couple of exceptions that the lodges use, is something called um, standard Scottish ritual. I'm not quite sure what standard Scottish ritual is. Um, and if that confuses me, it confuses the brethren over here to, uh, much more. Um, like, uh, because many of the brethren have and in the past did come from other jurisdictions, they brought their traditions with them. And it, it makes life pretty interesting. Freemasonry is quite a bit different uh, over here than it is in, in, in Scotland, probably a bit less formal. I would suggest that if any of you are in Israel and um, want to visit a, a lodge, just um, just look up the, the internet and, and wander in, get the time of meeting and wander in. It's very much like the Scottish way. You just, you don't have to be formally invited. You just go as a visitor and visitors are very well looked after. Um, I hope what I have said this evening is of some interest. Uh, thank you for not falling asleep. And if I can answer any questions, I'll be delighted to do so. Brother Ori Lovett, Past Master of Lodge Montefiore, thank you so much for that very interesting walk back over the last 70 years or so of the history of the development of the Grand Lodge 
of Israel and its connections, not only to your mother lodge, but also the wider Scottish craft. And I think, as many of the Brenham will agree, that understanding of what was happening in the 1800s uh, and the early part of uh, Freemasonry in the, the country is of great interest. I do know we've got some questions and comments for you, Ori, in the chats because the chat box was going... Uh, getting quite busy there so let me scroll down so I uh, shalom sorry I was a bit late uh, from Stevie Chalmers uh, I, the Irish Constitution Lodge might have been a field lodge attached to an army regiment and yes 4611 lodge and chapter still meet in London and that's from uh, brother Mike Kern uh, right uh, uh, Colin Clark, one of our, our guests from the US of A, asked if the, Earl, the E of E, the Earl of Elgin, is of the Marbles fame. Yes, that is the same family, Colin, of uh, those Marbles. Uh, that in itself is probably a story uh, at some right. point, but I, I'm not brave enough to, to challenge uh, Lord Elgin uh, about his Marbles. Uh, Michael Hearn says, New Lodge in Jordan under the Grand Lodge of Scotland was opened a few years ago, and I think someone else comments on that. Stevie Chalmers uh, reminds us of one of those other famous Freemasons, uh, brother Alex Rubenstein, past master of Solomon uh, in Edinburgh, was 104 year old uh, last week. And Wonderful. I believe uh, he still is a regular attender at the Lodge. So... Um, Michael Hearn also comments, Dr. Colenzo Jones was an assistant grand master in the Mark degree. Professionally, he was a company doctor of the Iraqi Petroleum Company. His office was at one time uh, IIRC uh, International in Haifa, the, the other end of the Kirkirk to Haifa oil pipeline. Uh, Golden Throne, 1344, meets in Amman, Jordan, and it was reponed on 4th of February 2016. See, Ari, we've got all the, the, the experts, are, uh, they're here. So uh, another comment, super talk. Nice to see the process followed. The Masonic tradition makes a great story. Fantastic place, Israel was there for a bit in 91. Uh, Michael Hearn comes back to Golden Throne, 1344, was declared dormant around 77, 78. Uh, Stevie Chalmers makes a comment about standard Scottish ritual, also refers to quality. Uh, <laughs> uh, Gerard uh, O'Donnell, wonderful lecture. My mother lodges Solon 1209. This lecture is an incentive to go to Israel and attend meetings. Uh, and Stevie, as it does in France with right, right standard, the course means same Scottish standard ritual with both meanings for standard. So a question, what about other orders like Royal Ark Mariners? Are they active? Um, well, the answer to that one is um, the, the chapter, and this is quite interesting, uh, the chapter is, uh, the Royal Arch is very active. Um, in fact, I was at a chapter meeting last night. Uh, we we're, we're actually have in in um, in Israel. We're actually opening. We're having Zoom meetings, which are properly um, opened, right? Uh, and but it's notional. We don't have any words or signs or what have you. But it's an there's a notional meeting. We actually had one in the chapter last night. Last night, and it, uh, we, were, we were talking. We can't do ritual as such, but. Um, Yes, the chapter is uh, is pretty vibrant. Um, the one of the differences is that they don't do the mark degree in the craft lodges over here. We do it in chapter. Now, um, this I wondered why this was. Um, apparently, when the, the the Supreme Grand Chapter was opened up here. And the auspices again by the Grand Lodge, by the Grand, uh, Supreme Grand Chapter, chapter of, uh, of Scotland, um, they'd swapped over the, the mark degree from the craft lodges to the chapter. I don't know why. Um, yes, that, uh, yes, most of the, most of the, uh, most degrees, side degrees are carried out here, uh, and one or two others which I haven't heard in Scotland. Um, 
the Scottish right is is quite popular here. Um, I bel- it has been de-Christianized. So if in Scotland it's uh, restricted, as you know, to Christians over here, any any you, people of any religion can can join Scottish right, uh, and the degrees go all the way up. So yes, there are other other degrees as well here. Okay, thank you. Uh, some more comments. Excellent lecture. Didn't have a clue. So many countries were involved. Excellent and informative lecture. Uh, Alec Curry sends his best. He, he's got a provincial Grand Lodge Zoom meeting. I don't know who those boys in Renfrewshire are leaving our, our meeting to go to a commissioned office bearer. Or when you've given us <laughs> such a great, interesting lecture this evening, but I'm sure I'll have a word with Alec later. Uh, I will tell him I was asking for him. Uh, we will do. Uh, Alan Keegan, that was terrific. Very shaming how Brotherhood was compromised by politics and probably not for the first time. Uh, fascinating history, Brother Ori, and makes us all appreciative of the trials and tribulations of many of our realm. Good news is all's well that ends well. Uh, due to visit Israel in 2022 and looking to visit Lodge Holy City number four. Uh, well, who's, who's saying that? Because that's Brother Joe Priest, there's a group I think being organised under the provincial, the district grand priory of Fife and Cro- Can Ross Joe. I think uh, they're looking to take a, a group of Freemasons over uh, in next year, 2022. Well, if you take my details, I'd be happy to help you with anything. That's I'll pass them on to Joe for you. Yep. Thank you so much. Um, and I think <clears throat> that comes to the end of the, the comments and the questions, Ori. I think uh, the manner in which you put it across, uh, uh, you just you just covered so much detail there. Well, I've actually just, um, I've only glanced over it, really. The, the contents of the correspondence that I have, it could quite easily form a, a book. Uh, and I, I'm not kidding about that. Uh, <laughs> it could quite easily be done. And the history as well of the, uh, the there were other Scottish lodges that, that, came and went, some really catered to, to Lebanon and what have you. Um, I've just concentrated on the ones that were extant in 1948. Well, Ori, I've, I've got a book on my, my Masonic library shelf behind me by uh, a good friend of yours, and it's a history of your mother lodge. Uh, so I look forward to the day I get your book to sit side by side, uh, that history. Yes. Well, that one is brought up to date. It was made in, uh, Charles wrote that in 1988. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's not as if he's got nothing else to do with himself just now. Anyway, yeah. so Brother Ori Lovett, Past Master Lodge Montefiore, once again on behalf of the Brown of the Lodge Hope of Karachi and all our guests here this evening, can I thank you once again for such an interesting lecture that you've presented to us. Thank you so much, sir. And you're always welcome along every Tuesday night if you've got the time to join us. In my thank pleasure. You. Thank you for thank you for asking. Brethren, next week uh, we have Brother John Belton uh, joining us. Uh, Brother Belton is a well-known Masonic researcher and historian, uh, a member of Lodge Ellen Gowan, if uh, my memory serves me correct, as well as a past master of Internet Lodge and a few others down south. Uh, John's going to come and talk to us about that Freemason called Joseph Fort Newton, who was a prolific writer in the early part of the 20th century. And he's going to talk to us about his tour of Britain and when he met Brother Andrew McBride. And we'll touch on Brother Andrew McBride with John next week. Uh, if you don't know who Andrew McBride is, Brian, uh, don't go to the Google just yet. Come along next Tuesday evening to our lockdown lecture and we'll be able to tell you uh, a little bit more about him. As ever, Brian, at this time, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourselves and say your thank yous and congratulations to Brother Ori Lovett. Thank you, Ori, once again. <laughs> Brian, the floor is open for thank yous. Thank, thank you very much, Ori. Yes, very well done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ori. That was super. Very much. Very good. Thank you very much. Enjoy it. Was it, very, it was very nice. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you, uh, Thank you very much, Thank you, Ari. Most enjoyable. Thank you. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. 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 Thank
Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Rory. Much. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you, Thank you Rory. That was Thanks excellent. very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Rory. 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 Thank you, brother Rory. It was excellent. If, if any of you are well, well, done. well done. Thank you very much. If any of you are coming over to Israel and you want any help with uh, with anything, just contact me. Um, uh, although I don't think you'll be coming out soon. I think uh, um, things are pretty well, yeah. well, pretty well um, secured in here at the moment. But, uh, Ori, we can't get across the fourth bridge, let alone get to Israel. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, that, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But, but there's um, there's uh, uh, the airport's closed here. You're, we're not allowed out anywhere. So, just thank you very much, my brother Ori. Thank you, brother Ori, for an excellent lecture. Thanks, brother Ori. Very interesting lecture. Thank you. Well done, Ori. Excellent lecture. Really enjoyed it. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Oh, bye, bye, everybody. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Excellent, excellent lecture, Rory. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank bye, you. Bye, yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Bernard. Cheers, Gordon. Cheers, man. Okay, well, thanks for your time tonight. and your wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Any of your bed for before the meeting gets here? <laughs> <laughs> and for Bern. No, we've all gone quiet. Three. Excellent night, sir. All right. Nice to have heard it. Um, good night, everybody. That was Alistair, a good Ronnie, wasn't it? Alistair, Alistair knows about the matrix because he's already caught her. Too brown. Hey, good night, Ori. Thanks for the lecture. Good to see you again. Tally up with the one, Gordon, for I can start commenting. And one, Bern, and that's the recording. Thanks. Thank you once again, Brother Ori. Love it. <laughs>